its differences and values diversity, be it in the built environment, urban fabric, or governing policies. Inclusiveness in all aspects of sustainability, that is social, environment, and economy, are reflected in the equitable access to resources such as accessible built environment, open areas, clean air, and basic necessities. This session shall explore the inclusiveness in various aspects of design, construction, planning in the urban fabric with focus on the challenges and solutions. I now invite our esteemed panelists on the stage, Dr. Rena Kosla, Director, Center for Urban and Regional Excellence, Professor Anup Mitra, Institute of Economic Growth, Ms. Shelly Potaja, Managing Director, Healthy People and Thriving Communities Program, NRDC, Ms. Swati Janu, Creative Director, MHS City Lab, Christopher Samuel, Center for Indian Bamboo Resource and Technology, and Professor Sarnam Singh, Dean School of Ecology and Environment Studies, Nalanda University. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have with us Dr. Reno Kosta as the chair of the session. Dr. Reno is the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence. Her work aims at unthinking and reimagining slum and inclusive urban development, building resilience and nudging change from below in community-led initiatives. Through her work, she has been seeking to strengthen local capacities, hoping to change the policy narrative and discourse, deepen the discourse on urban poor, slum upgradation and improving quality of life. It's an honor to have you here with us, ma'am. May I take the opportunity to welcome the speakers of the session. Professor Arup Mitra at Institute of Economic Growth, New Delhi. Professor Mitra's research interest includes issues in the area of urban development, labor and welfare, industrial growth and productivity, and gender inequality. He worked as a senior researcher at International Labor Organization and was offered visiting fellowship at Institute of Developing Economies, Tokyo, and held the Indian Economy Chair at Science PO, Paris. I welcome you, sir. Our next speaker is Ms. Shelley Potica. Ms. Shelley is the Managing Director at Healthy People and Thriving Communities Program, NRDC. She works with local, national, and global leaders to make cities part of the answer to climate change while ensuring that all people can lead healthy, thriving lives. She has served as President and CEO of Reconnecting America and as Executive Director of the Congress for New Urbanism. It's an honor to have you here, ma'am. Our next speaker is Ms. Swati Janu. Ms. Swati is the Creative Director at MHS City Lab. Ms. Swati is an architect and community artist who wo whose work engages with issues of social justice, right to housing and evictions in Indian cities. Her social practice combines community engagement, architectural activism and practice-based research on the themes of migration and urban informality. She was nominated as one of the 15 young leaders from India by the French Embassy. I welcome you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Mr. Christopher Samuel, Center for Indian Bamboo Resource and Technology. Mr. Samuel has worked in the brand management in the advertising industry for the first five years of his career. He moved into the development sector after working in communications for the International Development Research Center for a program which evolved into the International Network for Bamboo and Ratan and for the medicinal plant program in Asia. I welcome you, sir. And we have with us Professor Sarnam Singh, Dean School of Ecology and Environmental Studies, Nalanda University. He has a very dynamic background and a research experience of 40 years. I welcome you, sir. Let us extend a warm welcome to all our speakers. Now I request Dr. Renu Khosla to take the session further. Thank 
Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we're starting half an hour late, so hopefully you won't mind uh, staying a little late uh, and waiting for your lunch a bit. Um, just a quick uh, word on inclusion before I invite the speakers. Um, you know, cities are usually imagined as places where there are roads, where there are buildings, uh, where there's infrastructure, uh, but they are places where we live. These are places which provide us with our experiences, with our opportunities, um, and therefore, uh, these are places that must, must become better for us, which means we need a voice in the way these cities are planned, in the way these cities are designed, in the way these cities are structured. Um, so inclusiveness is about bringing in this perspective of people into the whole uh, development uh, agenda of a city. Um, if you look at uh, urbanization, uh, you know, s growth of cities, urbanization can be good and urbanization can be bad. If it's good urbanization, we would have people who are getting wealthier, we would have uh, more productivity, we would have places that are nicer to live in, all the services and infrastructure are there. But if it's bad urbanization, we begin to see inequality, we begin to see poverty, we begin to see informality, and, and a sense of exclusion, unequalness. Um, let's hear from our speakers on how do we deal uh, with some negative effects of uh, urbanization and how inclusion could be the answer to that. We've shuffled up the speakers a bit because as we were waiting for the previous session to be over, we've, we're going in with the macro city perspective. So we'll have Shelley uh, coming in first. Uh, and then followed by Arup and uh, Swati, who would be giving, uh, who would move on to talking about slums and informal settlements. And eventually we'll go, uh, sorry, Arup is here. Uh, eventually we would go to Sarnam and uh, Christopher, who would be talking about uh, ecosystems and how the city ecosystems need to be developed and designed in a holistic manner. Shelly. Yes, and 10 minutes, we'll still keep to 10 minutes. Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. And uh, I, I, someone needs to pull up the presentation for me, maybe while uh, I'm doing that. Um, thank you all for including me in this, in this okay. session. It's really an honor to be here. And in the few minutes we had before the session, I really uh, enjoyed meeting everyone. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to just speak just for a few minutes about uh, what is happening in the United States, particularly around U.S. cities and uh, their attempts to uh, address climate change in the face of the reality that our national government is not paying attention. And we know that climate change is happening in our, in our communities the people who are the most affected are the most vulnerable, the poorest, and the people who are, have been forced to live in areas that are very fragile, uh, uh, extremely uh, influenced by rain or extreme heat, and uh, are experiencing flooding at higher levels than others. And so what uh, we're doing is partnering up with a number of different organizations to work with uh, 25 American cities to uh, put in place the policies and programs that address climate change and through that work addressing the needs of the urban poor. So we have looked at uh, the U.S. sectors with uh, the greatest contributors to climate change in the US and buildings and transportation are really uh, what cities can actually control and how they 
um, can actually make a difference in people's lives. And so we're focusing on these four areas, reducing building energy use, increasing renewable energy, reducing the amount of travel, and electrifying vehicles. And you can see that this could be primarily for the most um, you know, privileged in our communities, but in fact, this initiative sponsored by the Bloomberg Foundation is really attempting to create uh, the strength and the capacity in communities to, to go further than that, go further than just what the market will bear, but also ensure that we are addressing our issues responsibly. So just a few months ago, we launched this challenge. We asked the 100 largest cities in the United States to partner with us, two in several NGOs. I'll show you our partners in a moment. We've ultimately selected 25 US cities that we will be working with to um, do almost what we think of as a sprint, address and em embrace a set of policies and programs through the year 2020 to address carbon pollution with the assumption that if we get going now, which is frankly late, um, we will begin to see that we can be on track to meet the Paris Climate Accords. We have a number of partners that we're working with. These are all uh, primarily US-based uh, NGOs who have uh, been working with communities uh, in different types of specialty areas. And we will uh, provide a set of technical assistance to our communities uh, that will help them both craft the policies that could be adopted in communities, ensure that they are implementing the programs that they already have in place, and working with community leaders to shape those policies. I think one of the biggest issues that is coming up in American cities is income inequality. And we have just a tremendous difference between those who have resources and can embrace these uh, new technologies or new approaches and those that really don't have those. And we will not be successful if we only focus on the well-to-do. We have to bring them together. So part of our resources will go to ensure that those community-based organizations can participate in the design and strategy that will reduce carbon pollution coming from their cities. This is a list of the cities that we are working with. The map is a little bit washed out, so it's a little hard to see here. But this is a national initiative. It's looking at places that have very infrequently addressed carbon pollution. Uh, Texas is one state that, you know, built itself on the oil and gas industry, now is shifting to um, wind in particular, but only, you know, cities, there are only a few cities that are actually truly trying to challenge uh, the status quo. Whereas we have a number of cities in some of those blue states, California, Oregon, Washington in particular, um, on the West Coast, that have been working on addressing carbon pollution for many years, and we're starting to see an alignment between what the city policies are and the state policies. Um, maybe what I will do here is uh, focus just on two more slides before I conclude. What we have learned in working with cities in the United States is that we can you know, partner up with maybe one city and work very tailored way to uh, address their needs. But that is insufficient to the scale of the problem that we have in the United States. We have to really start to work beyond a single city to many, many cities. And so this framework of foundational uh, efforts that every city should really be doing to say that they are a green city is, is something that's new in our lexicon. We're trying to really uh, bring that forward and do it in a way that builds an understanding that if you're not doing these actions, you're not a sustainable, inclusive community. And then another set of activities, what we call ambitious efforts, that we know that cities can take right now, 
uh, to address their climate change, but you know they need to really lean in and do more aggressive work. And then a third category we call moonshot, which is you know how do we set the table for even greater impact going forward? So let me just skip ahead to my two final slides and then I'll wrap up just to show you an example of the kinds of uh, policies and actions and interventions that we're working with with these 25 cities. You can see how they begin to lay out in this kind of foundational ambitious moonshot framework. And in every one of these, there is going to be an expectation that the implementation address all communities, that we are in some cases even privileging poor communities over uh, market rate communities because they need the uh, cost savings and the health benefits and the climate resiliency that, um, that others have the you know, resources to be able to address. This is the second area around transportation where we're looking at making sure that cities really have that uh, public transport network, that they have uh, the ability for folks to bike and walk in their communities, um, that there are electric vehicle opportunities in both uh, market rate areas and uh, lower income neighborhoods, and that we're creating whole systems that allow people to get to work, uh, to thrive in their communities, and to live healthy lives. So I will just conclude by saying that um, this is a really challenging time in the United States. I'm sure you see in the news um, all of the conflict that we're having, both with our national government but also in communities. It is a very, very tense time. Uh, and we are very divided politically, where we have, you know, very little ability to speak with each other on difficult issues. And so one way that this American Cities Climate Challenge has been um, a positive insertion is that it's about getting something done that can really help the people in our communities. Mayors in particular in the United States have understood that by acting on climate, they are creating economic opportunity for the people in their communities. By acting on climate, they are addressing the health challenges that people in their communities have. Air pollution in particular has really emerged as a major threat to health. And so, um, they're, they're responding because of that. And then there's a cost savings to the government that has also become an imperative in US cities where when we have a major uh, storm and streets flood and people's homes are um, impacted and they have to pay for the cost of uh, cleaning up and replacing and flooring, it is causing a real impact to our communities. And so that awareness is just starting to happen in the United States. It is being led by cities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shadi. Um, I like the urgency that you brought with the term sprint. Uh, I, I think cities do need to recognize that there is need to take some urgent action, but then the action has to be in a very, very planned uh, manner, and the planning needs to engage with the people. Um, Aru, you're next. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share our findings on urban uh, areas, cities in particular. And of course, I will be talking something about the slums. 
<clears throat> what are the strategies of survival? How do they access jobs? Whether there is any possibility of experiencing upward mobility? How the social capital and the political networks operate in giving them access to better economic opportunities? And what about the relationship of well-being index in relation to city size are some of the questions that we are going to take up. But before that, let me uh, talk to you about uh, something very interesting. That for, we try to pose a question, how dynamic or how inclusive the Indian cities are. And in that context, based on the population census data, primarily focusing on housing characteristics, access to basic amenities, and having access to certain types of assets. We were trying to construct a well-being index, or take the reverse of that, the deprivation index, for each of these 5,000 and all cities and towns in India. So once we did that, through a principal component analysis, we tried to come up with a specific index value for each of these cities and towns. And then we distributed them across various size classes, and we were trying to pose that what percentage of cities and towns are actually lying at the bottom, at the lower echelons of the well-being levels. And we found that about 70 to 80 percent of the cities and towns are quite well off. They are at much higher levels of well-being index. So that, that ends with a very optimistic note. But then in the second stage, we are trying to pose this question. How does this well-being index square up with many other indicators of development? Say, for example, literacy, fertility rate, workforce participation rate, people engaged in certain dynamic activities, etc. And there we find that workforce participation rate, literacy rate, they are all in positive relationship with some of these uh, well-being index. In urban economics literature, you come across a very interesting proposition. People try to argue here that if there is concentration, concentration of population, concentration of economic activities, then automatically it gives rise to economies of scale. And hence, productivity levels in large cities, by definition, would be much higher than their counterparts in small cities and towns. So from that point of view, we are trying to see whether this well-being index is in positive relationship with city size. Well, there is a positive relationship, but in the Indian context, it is extremely weak. So then we are trying to pose this question, perhaps the basic objective of inclusiveness is not, is not being attained. Now, in order to further probe into these issues, we have then carried out a survey in Delhi and some uh, the other four uh, cities of uh, Jaipur, Ludhiana, uh, Mathura, and Ujjain. Jaipur, as you know, is a dynamic one, and Ludhiana is an industrial city. Mathura and Ujjain are so, sort of stagnant cities. So what we get to see here is that social capital plays a crucial role in accessing the job market information pertaining to the urban labor market. Of course, by informal networks, we mean the caste, kinship, bonds, the, the true general relatives, etc., the kind of networks which follow. Also, we have alternately the more formal channels, that is through NGOs, through employment exchanges, through the references of, of your employers, etc. But uh, uh, what, again, the findings tend to suggest that as you diversify your network, then only you are able to experience upward mobility. We have tried to estimate an occupational choice function and also the upward, uh, upward mobility function, the binomial logic framework. And it tries to suggest that if you are taking recourse to the traditional networks, then you are stuck at the lower equilibrium levels. You are not able to experience upward mobility. Only when there is network diversification, you are able to experience upward mobility. And then coming to political networks, we are again able to see the political, the local politicians are trying to access the social network groups. It's not the individual which matters for them. It is the, it's the social capital which they have formed is of great interest to the politicians. And there is a negotiation between the local politicians and these groups. So you, you give us the sanitation facility, you give us the drinking water, and in return we give you the vote bans. <coughs> so the, now moving on to the well-being index, we were trying to estimate uh, it through certain economic characteristics, demographic characteristics, health and uh, uh, education specific characteristics, and the social characteristics. I don't go into the details of this. So based on that, again, um, through a factorial analysis, we came up with 
an index value, well-being index for each of these slum households in all these four cities. And as I told you, the hypothesis is that more dynamic a city is, smaller should be the percentage of households lying in the lower echelons of the size classes. And that is what it tends to suggest, that as we move from Jaipur, Ludhiana to Mathura and Ujjain, a much larger percentage of slum households are located in the lower size classes. So even among the slum dwellers, we get to see that those who are located in big cities, they are able to experience much betterment compared to their counterparts in small and medium sized towns. So from this point of view, we have again tried to work out the relationship between well-being index and the duration of migration as they continue to stay whether they are able to escape their poverty. And again, there is a positive relationship, but it is not a linear relationship. So what it means that in the very long run, perhaps the second generation migrants are able to experience a decline in their incidence of poverty or in the decline in the incidence of their deprivation, but not really the fresh migrants are able to escape their poverty. So from that point of view, the inclusiveness is again uh, is, is, is being challenged. At this, uh, based on the state level data, we were again trying to um, work out a, a sort of a small macroeconometric model and through which we were trying to um, visualize the relationship between rural to urban migration, urban informal sector employment and poverty. And what we find that there is a positive association. In other words, there are considerable overlaps between slum dwelling, informal sector employment and rural to urban migration. However, when we work out the elasticity of urban poverty with respect to rural poverty, it is extremely small. So what it tends to suggest that if you implement the rural development programs with all sincerity, it, it is not going to take care of urban poverty in totality. So there is a relationship between urban poverty and rural poverty, but at only at the margin. So that's because many of the urban poor have been residing in the urban areas for a considerably long period of time. So from that point of view, we vouch for the urban poverty specific programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. It was a very, very interesting study. And, um, you know, I think what I take from that is that we need to have more diversity um, and the more diverse the city is, there is more likelihood of uh, uh, this uh, opportunities and uh, growth. So I think it kind of coincides with a study that Cure had also done once, where we, <coughs> we recognized that migration into urban areas uh, to cities which are more industrialized, uh, you know, the industrialized cities tend to absorb these skilled workers, whereas uh, the, the cities like Delhi, actually where you can have an opportunity for informal work actually attracted a lot of the informal people. So I think it would be interesting to see how we, you know, correlate, correlate all that. But, but I, I think this is some, this can give us some more, you know, insight into how do we uh, design and plan our cities in a way that we are able to provide that diverseness um, into. So what you're really saying is migration is going to happen and we need to be dealing with it. Okay. Um, yeah. Before we start, um, just by show of hands, I wanted to understand how many of us are architects and planners here. Um, designers of any kind? Okay, so that's 50%. Okay, so I think uh, my presentation is a bit relevant. And uh, how many from Terry? The other half? Okay, <laughs> okay so um, while our planners and policy makers are figuring out what smart cities means in the context of India, let's look at um, self-built cities, which is how most of our cities are being built. Uh, more than 50% of housing in uh, most of our cities has been built by the people themselves, often with the help of a local mason who also doubles up as a contractor, engineer, designer, and architect. Um, in Delhi itself, 70% um, of housing has been self-built. If you include um, slums or squatter settlements uh, called JJ clusters, Jogi Jopi clusters, uh, unauthorized colonies, urban villages, and plotted resettlement uh, colonies. Um, Today, India faces a deficit of 18 million houses. Is someone's phone close to the speaker? 
um, faces a deficit of 18 million housing units. And in the face of this challenge, in the face of this deficit, uh, people are building their own affordable housing. So I argue for um, a, a sort of a stand in which informal settlements be viewed as a self-created uh, solution to the lack of affordable housing that we have today. Um, and uh, what role, I have been trained as an architect, so what role do architects, designers and engineers play um, in Indian cities where most people don't have access to their services? Uh, I'm going to quickly discuss um, a project that I've been working on for three years now to be able to discuss with you the different processes that we could be involved in to be engaging with low-income, marginalized communities who are living in self-built, uh, informally built settlements. Uh, this is a rural community on the banks of uh, the Yamuna in Delhi. Uh, it's a non-notified slum. It's that yellow circle over there, very close to where Sri Sri set up his World Culture Festival um, two years uh, back. Um, and this is uh, called Yamuna Khadar, this region. Now, there are lots of farming communities um, along the Yamuna who have been farming for decades there. And over the last few years, they've been facing almost annual evictions, in which what happens is bulldozers arrive, uh, sent, uh, sent by, the N uh, by the DDA on the order of the NGT, and um, raise uh, these settlements to the ground, also bulldozing often um, over their farms and uh, their crops. Um, in 2011, um, so this is uh, this is close to the area because a flyover a flyover is being built across the Yamuna, very close to where uh, we worked here. And um, in 2011, uh, what happened uh, during one of the demolitions was um, it was uh, much more brutal in nature. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the sort of violence that the state inflicts on informal uh, communities. Um, in Delhi, we have about 15 to 20 evictions every year, which often go unreported and unheard of, um, unless it's the case of Katputli Colony, which has been in the media for, for a few years. And so in 2011, a school uh, which was there for 200 uh, students from 1991 was demolished. And um, we talk about right to education, but what does that mean in a country where a school is demolished, uh, even if it is an illegal um, sort of a settlement? And uh, so the people from the community approached the high court, they filed a PIL, and they got a permission to rebuild the school. This is not the school. Um, it was a brick building. It was an old cow shed which was converted into a, a school for the students. Uh, this is a sort of a temporary shelter that the youth had put together after the demolition so that the students could continue um, uh, learning. And uh, after they got a permission to rebuild the school, um, a few of them approached me through a social worker, Shaquille, and they asked if uh, we could build a temporary school. And what temporary means was uh, you know, open to interpretation. Does it mean using temporary materials or does it mean building a school which can be quickly built and perhaps unbuilt or dismantled or opened up, which is what we did. Um, so we began by looking at uh, the way people are already building there, which is using dried grass, uh, split bamboo, uh, bamboo mats, uh, and also observing the details that you know, people have come up with. I particularly like the one on the right, which is a way to hold down the tarpaulin, the plastic sheet, on the roof, uh, by uh, sort of uh, d uh, embedding half of a cycle tire uh, inside the ground. On the left is a sort of a pop-up temporary um, uh, structure, which is um, a mosquito net around four poles, which are then tied to the cart at night. So learning from uh, these sort of approaches, we came up with a design. I worked on this with a very uh, another uh, young architect, uh, Nidhi Sohane. And the design um, involved, after lots of iterations and discussions, and also the funding available, uh, most of which was crowdsourced, uh, with a metal structure so that it could last uh, uh, long and could be quickly bolted and unbolted. And the infill walls, um, the doors and the windows were made um, of reused wood um, as frames and uh, bamboo as, as the sort of uh, panels inside them, using the materials that uh, were available there and how people were already building. Uh, very quickly, um, the doors on one side, uh, the windows on the other, uh, pivoted doors were used because they don't require frames. And also the idea was to create a very open sort of a school and also um, uh, to be able to take pride in the sort of materials and construction technologies that their families were already building in. So this was a visualization of the school and this is how it looked after we built it. And perhaps I think the most, uh, in, well, 
A uh, meaningful feature for me has been the way we built it, which is a very hands-on sort of a, a process in which the members of the community, the students, some of their parents, because they have a lot of uh, work at the farms, um, so it's difficult to take out time, and a lot of volunteers, so young architects, students, um, so um, they gathered and uh, we built it ourselves with our own hands. Um, apart from the metal work, all the carpentry and the bamboo work was done by us, mostly women. And here you can see the, the wood being cut, the bamboo being split, that's the metal structure. There was a team of welders and we built this uh, within three weeks uh, despite challenges such as early monsoons, um, Eid and uh, uh, you ha we have to use a diesel uh, generator because it's a completely off-grid uh, community. So to be able to use the power, uh, the power tools. And the bamboo sort of uh, work was, uh, was quite simple. So the students were able to build their own walls, their own um, doors and windows. And you can see they're quite light. The, this is one of the doors. The headmistress is uh, the one and the sari who's also trying to install uh, one. And this is how the school finally looked. And uh, this, is how the, uh, this is how the school looked um, after a year, uh, which is when we had to dismantle it and move it. Um, so what had happened is um, the, the owner who had sort of like rented the space, um, uh, he wanted the land back uh, uh, because of certain issues. And uh, the school was dismantled in, um, to, uh, in April this year. Uh, we built it last year uh, in June, and uh, this is uh, yeah, so, so basically the, the people who run the school, they dismantled it, I think, in a few hours, over two days, because it was uh, really hot to be working during the day. And we had numbered all the different parts so that they could go back together where they belong when it could be rebuilt. Unfortunately, um, the, the administration has been trying to rebuild it in the same area. It's not possible anymore because of the construction um, of the flyover. There's a lot of, uh, there's much more vigilance by the DDA officials. And after months of trying, um, they gave up and they're not rebuilding the school uh, there anymore. However, another NGO has adopted the school, the Child Trust, and uh, they're building it further down south, again, uh, uh, for the children of farmers and migrant workers um, along the Hinden River, which is one of the tributaries of uh, Yamuna. So that's further down south in uh, Greater Noida. And we will be, we, uh, so the school was uh, just relocated uh, beginning of this month and will be rebuilt um, in, in, I hope, by the end of the year. Uh, this is uh, the last class uh, in this school. So this uh, project um, uh, helped us understand what are the various sort of processes uh, that architects and designers could take to be working uh, with uh, communities. And at the same time, it also helped us understand uh, um, uh, you know, something you've always known about, but also uh, the urban precarity, the sort of precarity that these communities live in and how they cope with it, and also how your practice sort of also, uh, you know, learns to cope with it, though obviously not at the same sort of, um, I think, uh, level that these communities uh, live in. But more than that, it also helped us understand at a larger um, scale uh, the challenges being faced by all the farming communities living along uh, the river, which are facing evictions today. Um, they all have been given a notice to be, um, uh, you know, to, to be moved from there by 2019. And uh, according to the <clears throat> sorry, according to the Zone O plan of the Master Plan and the Yamuna Riverfront Development Plan, um, uh, it stipulated that biodiversity parks be built here. And uh, the question that needs to be asked, which is also something my students at SP are looking at right now, they're presenting the work tomorrow. If anyone's interested in attending, um, is um, why can't we also have farms? Why do we um, are parks more sustainable than farms? And in Europe today, just like uh, smart cities is a buzzword here, the buzzword today is urban farming and urban agriculture. And since we like to emulate Western sort of models uh, so much, uh, perhaps we need to remember that we already have urban farming at the heart of the city. And do we want to lose that to kind of import it again after, after a decade from uh, another European architect? That doesn't sound very smart to me. Um, in conclusion, if I have two more minutes, um, this is um, another project which sort of grew um, with this uh, practice. Um, this is an attempt to document the evictions in Delhi. Like I told you, there are about 15 to 20 evictions every year, um, which, which go undocumented. And uh, this is um, something that we started out with as a workshop with uh, students from SEPT, in which they try to document uh, the evictions over the last two years. And 
<clears throat> sorry. Uh, now it's become a bigger project um, uh, involving uh, human rights lawyers, academics, um, activists, and social workers, in which the idea is to map all the evictions since 1990 uh, up till today. And also, it's a sort of a live database where you can because evictions are going to be happening, I guess, unless the policies change drastically overnight. Um, so we can uh, sort of also document the next sort of eviction that happens. Um, and it's called Missing Basti because parts of our cities um, are really disappearing, often overnight, um, which have been there for decades. And uh, these parts need to be, uh, well, um, documented, if not saved. And also, uh, the other uh, uh, important uh, thing here is uh, also the sort of missing data that we have, which is also a reason why perhaps policymakers don't even realize the sort of state brutality uh, that many of these communities uh, face. Um, so the students uh, documented stories of uh, eviction. Um, this is a sort of a, well, a, a, a story board of uh, what happens on the day of an eviction. The bulldozers arrive, uh, you know, very early in the morning, often without a notice, which is also illegal. And uh, police uh, places barricade, you know, all around the community. Half the half the people rush to uh, uh, take care of their belongings and uh, save them, and the other half rush to stop the bulldozer. And by the end of the day. Uh, there's very little that is left, and also stories of uh, people um, and stories of the places that um, don't exist uh, anymore. And in conclusion, going back to uh, what I started out with, which is um, the, the sort of housing deficit that we face today, um, by 2022, uh, Housing for All, uh, that's the sort of target that we have. And in the last two, three years, I think a mere 1 or 1.5% 1 has been built. It sounds next to impossible to be building these new housing units. It makes more sense. It's smarter to be perhaps supporting and uh, facilitating this process of self-construction that is already going on by providing them access to technical and, and engineering expertise so that they can build safer, stronger uh, structures and also uh, design input so that these spaces can be designed better in terms of light ventilation and definitely support uh, and uh, support um, and in terms of the facilities and infrastructure that can be provided. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Very interesting study of hope and despair. And what I kind of the hope that I mean the, the participation, the wisdom, the place making that happened with your project and then eventually uh, you know this is the typical contestation between slums and non-slums because the land is informal and uh, you know so you find that uh, city um, administrators tend to forget that this is about people and this is where people live and this is what the people what this is what people need and so there is this whole thing about eviction and uh, removal um, yes I am I mean um, I think there is a need to uh, revisit the whole housing approach and strategy and we did try uh, last year when the government of India was trying to build up it's still uh, on the on the annual to do a housing policy for uh, for uh, uh, and and they, this is one of the things that they clearly forget that people build by themselves, people build incrementally, and that cities and this country or the state does not have enough money to invest in doing housing for everyone, and therefore it is it makes a lot more sense. Uh, it makes a lot more economic sense to bring people into and let them invest in their own housing. Okay, we move on to Christopher now. Now, urbanization has a lot of issues, you know, pollution and all that, blah, blah, blah. You all know that. Now, urbanization also consumes adjacent agricultural lands. Now, in Delhi, 34% of croplands has, has gone since 21. Okay. Now...
Now, what is happening to the farmers? The, the farmers are growing old. There's high risk. The uh, pollution, all that stuff, which is happening to in the within the city with economic growth, is happening outside the city with negative growth. The the farmers are old. They are seventy percent of this thirty four percent are farmers with less than two acres of land. They're marginalized. Mm. They can do very little. Their children want to see the bright lights of the city. They are no, no longer interested. Now, therefore, inclusive growth, especially in the context of uh, urbanization, has to include the adjacent areas. Okay. Now, Sibat happens to be a agency sixteen with sixteen years of experience. It also is a group of NGOs and social enterprises and for-profit enterprises with a collective experience of 70 years. We work in poverty alleviation and livelihood generation and environmental protection. Now, what's, we have projects which, are, which started off as grant, with grant funding and have become sustainable. They, are, they, they work according to orders. We have two CFCs in Gujarat under grant funding. Now we have four under our own funding. Maharashtra is uh, building bamboo resorts in the Maldives, in India and all over. We don't even know what's happening there. So what we decided, we wanted a, a place where we could showcase what we are doing all over India. And we chose Noida. Uh, Noida, the, that part of Noida which is way out. Okay, and then we said we will. We also manufacture tissue culture labs, so we wanted a production setup. So we wanted to do that there. Then we said we'll do construction. Then we saw there's a sewage treatment plant outside, opposite. So we, we uh, the the founder of Sibat had earlier in a pro as a, headed a project where sewage sludge was treated with fly ash, which causes uh, pollution and made into a composite fertilizer. It increases uh, growth rate up to 5% of plants. So we talked to those guys, they said, please take as much as you want. The fly ash guys said, pay for the transport and we'll give you. So we decided we will start converting sewage into fertilizer with a small pelleting machine, cost uh, about 10 or 15,000 rupees, and we can brand it and sell it, hopefully. But we said we'll also start a plantation nearby. We'll use this fertilizer to for our own plantation. Then we said we looked at this farmer. These old guys uh, don't want don't want to farm. They have damn good reasons for it, but whatever. So we said we will lease your land from you. We will grow bamboo fruit on it. We will decide according to what uh, species we need. We will do intensive, we will start off with 400, uh, we will do intensive farming. We'll rent your land, we'll show you what, we'll do intercropping, we'll do all kinds of things. We'll make a water body, bamboo is good for, all that's there. We'll uh, do fishing, we'll give you a model farm, we'll show you a model farm on these 30 acres, which we will start, I mean in a phased manner. Okay, so... This is basically what we are doing. There will be a plantation which will provide, which will sell poles. We will also use it for our own work. These plantations, uh, these plantations, uh, bamboo generates about 35% more oxygen than trees. The bamboo absorbs, bamboo is uh, bushy and uh, tall and bushy, it absorbs VOCs. It is a shelter belt. Okay. It can be used in a variety of purposes. Now what we're doing is in those in that area there's a lot of agri waste. So we thought we'll collect the agri waste. And we have a gasifier, we have piloted and uh, successfully piloted a project where sixty thousand uh, people in Rajasthan and Gujarat benefited from power plus household charcoal production. So we will do household charcoal production. We will make briquettes, charcoal briquettes from, we will, from biomass agri-waste. We will also make 
bamboo brickets which are bamboo brickets uh, do not emit any smoke when burnt okay we will okay we will also plan bio cng we will now in this we will generate power now the point is when we generate power about 10 to 20 percent is uh, is charcoal that is a byproduct okay this 10 to 20 percent can go up to from 40 tons a day if we get 40 tons of day of biomass we can generate 180,000 rupees per month which makes the whole thing viable now essentially the, this is just one model which is using bamboo it is not only using bamboo but it is uh, majorly using bamboo and i think farmers and policy makers uh, should look at the viability of these kinds of models this is viable it is it's not been proven it will be and uh, I think this inclusive approach could scale up into a, you know, a landscape of, uh, a landscape of protective shelter beds around Delhi. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, as I said, everybody loves a green field project. And even if it means gobbling up all the land that's on our peri-urban fringe, but that's how our cities are beginning to sprawl. And the more sprawl, the more mobility needs, uh, and housing is cheaper at the periphery, and therefore the old uh, complicated urbanization issues emerge. Um, I like the way you've looked at it in a very, very ecosystemic way, where you've tried to connect all the various products and byproducts of what is coming out and, and I think that's the nature of projects that we, we see we should be heading towards which is trying to connect all the dots and follow a very very comprehensive approach. Sir Tom. Um, Well, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Chair and the panelists uh, for giving me also this opportunity and I am standing between you and the lunch. So my effort will be to be as brief as possible. I have uh, two things to share with you. One is that uh, I come from Nalanda University, which is has been revived recently. So I would like to say something about that. Most of the persons from India would know about the significance of Nalanda and its, you know, history. And then, since the campus is being built and the what strategy we have adopted uh, in terms of the inclusive development what that is today's uh, theme i would like to tell you about a little bit of that uh, nalanda university is a, what called an avant garde university that means it's a unique university uh, it is started basically about 2008 but our we started academic activities from 2014 onwards. At present, we have only three schools, School of Ecology and Environment Studies, School of Buddhist Studies and Other Religions, and School of History. I'll just elaborate what School of Ecology and Environment Studies uh, does. It's very unique in the sense uh, we try to cover all kinds of issues which probably some of the panelists have highlighted and which we are in facing probably in today's development process. Uh, we have the three stages like foundational courses, then bridge courses and the electives. And the, in foundational course, we try to expose the students of our master's program uh, about the ecology, the environment, waste management, environmental laws, air, soil, water pollution, society, laws, economics of the environment, climate change, sustainable development, and overall, we try to also tell you the current trends in the technology. Like even biotechnology is also part of their nanotechnology also we teach. And we also teach about the remote sensing and GIS. These are the upfront technologies which are being used very frequently for all development planning purposes. Uh, we have roughly 30 electives. It's a huge choice and students can select any one of these three or four or five 
and can get expertise which will be very relevant to these today's societal needs. It's not a very traditional way of teaching ecology or environment or botany or zoology. It's entirely different. So I would suggest some of you to please visit and maybe some students who are interested to take up this kind of course can come to Nalanda University and have a look of it. Uh, uh, let me also tell you what we are doing uh, while we are uh, developing our new campus. The, the campus uh, fits into the th today's theme as when we call it inclusive development. Uh, we have roughly 455 ac acres of land plus 100 acres we are likely to get. The whole concept here is that it has to be an energy efficient campus in terms of almost all spheres of uh, energy consumptions we can talk about. And therefore, we will talk about the sustainability, which is very important to us. And the priority for us is the, that means we call it net zero campus. Net zero campus means we would like to have zero carbon emissions. And if I say negative carbon emissions, that means we have our approximately half of the area where we are going to plant nearly half, one, one lakh of the trees in that area which will sequester carbon dioxide emitted from even neighboring regions and store as a biomass. So that is going to be negative, great contribution to that. Uh, we have lakes in between the classrooms and library and buildings everywhere spread. So all the rainwater is harvested, which is recycled. And again, you know, at different places for all kinds of purposes. So we don't uh, uh, really allow it to just run away or, you know, go waste. Uh, similarly, we will, because it's an university, we will have a lot of uh, biodegradable waste material. So we have also a strategy for uh, how to handle this uh, biodegradable waste. So for that, we have a zero waste policy for that. Overall, the objective is that we would like to have a, a uh, called university that has very negative or no environmental impacts in that particular area. So that's basically we try to renew all that kind of resources which will be available to us. Let me just elaborate how we are doing it. Uh, we are following what we call Ahar Pine traditional irrigation system which exists in Bihar in the neighboring states, in neighboring I mean villages there. And we will try to harvest all the water in the lakes and we have some canals which are linking. And uh, that will basically try to, you know, improve the groundwater recharge in that area and that water which is coming from rooftops or in the lakes which is stored all is going to be utilized as best as possible. We are also planning to put solar panels above the lakes that means it will not allow the water to evaporate first thing. Second thing we will get the solar energy trapped through the solar system. So I mean we have the above these lakes we have solar panels as well as the terrestrial lake, I mean area which is uh, wasteland, we have put the solar panels there. Uh, we have a, called the, a technology called DWAP, that's called the uh, desiccant evaporative technology. It's an advanced technology which talks about the an natural air conditioning system where you use the, uh, what you call the uh, sources from the gas and the liquid to regulate the temperature in the buildings. That means we basically don't need, uh, you know, uh, these window ACs and all that kind of uh, infrastructure. The temperature will be regulated in such a way that it is maybe hot outside, maybe inside it is very pleasant. Therefore, to uh, regulate the microclimatic conditions within the campus itself, uh, all these infrastructure which is being developed will have like dry cooling cup, uh, towers. We will have, uh, I mean, very large number of native species of trees grown there. And we are also planning to have the aesthetic sense put in there actually, because not only the ameliorative, regulative or protective roles of the forestry, aesthetic sense is also very important. So we will have the trees put in such a way that we will have the flowers and fruits throughout the year. So we are planning that way that uh, like the campus should look uh, aesthetically also very good. Uh, we also have uh, what you call the, uh, you know, uh, the, that area is uh, in seismic zone. So we have also taken care of that. Uh, 
so that you know there's no impact of any minor earthquake and all that so we have a very good uh, uh, you know system called the uh, integrated boxes of machinery to achieve the seismic stability in that particular area so the buildings are designed in such a way that uh, normal tremors and earthquakes are not going to be impacting the buildings uh, the cavity the walls are again they have cavity that means they can their space empty space they can regulate the temperature uh, we will also try to have the what you call the uh, decentralized water treatment plants called dwat in i mean and have efficient waste management system and uh, we were talking about the inclusiveness of the local populace in that area uh, we are thinking to have the biogas so that we'll have the waste generated from the neighboring villages maybe agriculture waste or the you know animal waste to try to collect and then uh, treat it and have the uh, gas or electricity whatever is to be produced we are putting the solar panels in a very big way and then uh, uh, we will try to you know as much as possible to clean the uh, air which because bihar is also one of the states where you have lot of pollution so we'll try to uh, do all kinds of uh, processes which will help to clean the air so that we can reduce the air pollution water pollution and the soil pollution so that is the basic objective of uh, the campus which is being developed because uh, uh when you talk in terms of the inclusive developmental activity uh, i think these are very important because uh, if you have to have we don't want to develop that university as an urban heat island no that we don't want to do because i think lot of architects are sitting here you know what is urban heat island is there so we would like to regulate the uh, air flow in such a way that it really doesn't affect or create either very microclimatic warm or hot spots in the uh, in the concrete jungle so that's not the basic idea of this university and therefore we would like to have the um, all these things done so that uh, you know the education can be imparted in as best as manner possible uh, before i close uh, i would like to thank the chair for allowing me to speak for few minutes i know I, 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 it's not a structured presentation but you wanted me to say something so that's the way uh, i would like to thank all the my colleagues who are working on this project actually this is a big team who have implemented this net zero compass uh, concept yeah, we have engineers one of the engineers is sitting here uh, yeah this gentleman uh, they have they are implementing all these issues and we have a team which is led by the our honorable vice chancellor and uh, there is a team for you know evaluating whether we are really doing you know saying is something different on paper whether we are doing and implementing it uh, is also very important and uh, you must have seen one of our vc today got an award also uh, that is basically to get towards uh, you know this kind of a project which will be uh, having this inclusive development energy efficient and the you know least uh, i should say you know anti you know climatic uh, condition creating that kind of agency so thank you very much i don't want to stand in between you for lunch and thank you very much thank you professor sir you may not but i think we do need another 15 minutes of conversation um we are after the, all the speakers have now spoken um just to you know add to the kind of uh, just an example from our own work which we've done in the city of agra which is about building water resilience So as cities are becoming uh, drier and desertifying, uh, Kyor has helped the Agra city to develop a water resilience strategy, and then implement and develop uh, community rainwater harvesting systems that, in the last rain, actually generated almost two lakh liters of water. So if you do the back end calculation, the economics of it all, you realize how much the city stands to save. Uh, how much the household saves in procuring and buying uh, cleaner water because they are dependent on groundwater and how much water you can put back into the so i i think the habitat the approach to uh, you know developing a, a core habitat area and then scaling it up and involving the neighborhoods uh, around you i think that's a that's a very that that is the way to go forward It's open to questions, observations, comments. Uh, not too long. 
if you want to, uh, you know, don't make speeches, but we can come and have a little bit of a dialogue. Hungry. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yes. So, talking about the smart villages, yeah. so what can be the way forward? Smart villages, yes, I'd like to take that. Good idea. Yeah. You want to? Smart villages. Smart villages. Uh, villages cannot uh, really be smart. They can, they can use bioenergy, they can use.
very actively destroying the sort of traditional architecture that we have built, uh, you know, for um, over the ages. And uh, and I think um, we have good schemes. Uh, Narega is, I think, a very good scheme. The implementation there's much to be desired. But I think also understanding. And it's difficult, you know, if you have uh, sort of like big numbers that you have to achieve, you know, 18 billion by 2022, and the sort of like the Swachh Bharat toilets, and uh, yeah, you have these ambitious goals, then they are implemented for the sake of being implemented, and perhaps the context is not really understood in how it works for different communities. So we have good schemes, but uh, uh, yes, it's, it's the sort of pace and the implementation uh, that needs to be reworked. Uh, yes, I think I, I would like to, you know, kind of uh, re reinforce this fact that smart is seen as digital. And, you know, so there is that equal, that smart equals digital. But that's not smart. Smart cities or smart villages are places where people, the, which respond to people's needs. That's what smartness is about. And, and I think we really need to reimagine what smartness is uh, in today's context. Um, but you know, we also just just very to you know add to what you were saying to the thought. Um, you know, there is an assumption that people who are poor or living in villages, rural people, they don't know. We know. We are wiser than them. They're stupid. Actually, they've been living there for generations. And I think if any one of us, if today I am told to go and live in a slum, I can't survive there. If I have to go and live, uh, use a public toilet or defecate in the open, I think I would be devastated. And, and therefore, I think we, we need to understand how people live and therefore try and create solutions that are uh, that that actually respond to their needs and create the kind of diverseness that that would allow these opportunities to come their way and and help them you know kind of come out of poverty. Is there any other um, question? Anybody wants to add a comment? Any thought? Yes, one more. Okay. Yeah, the idea is it's not something like a single village because village area is hardly. If we talk about a cluster of places and come out with this thought of a smart place, so that we facilitate people over there in such a way that we have got centers of various facilities and they are enjoying it. So economically, it is being done. At the same time, it is being going to be maintained and managed well. So how's that? Uh, I mean, it's inclusion is about innovation. When you have people participate in your, uh, you know, program uh, planning, in the planning itself, you would be coming up with these kinds of innovative solutions. How do you cluster people together? Can you do intersectionality? Uh, you know, how do you bring uh, uh, different agendas uh, which can be addressed by different skill sets among different people? Sure, I, I, it's, a, it's a good idea, but don't please just assume that if you've given them a smartphone and you, you, you've made a smart village or you've made a smart person, to be very honest, even a smart person. Okay. They already have this smartphone. Yes, they have. No, 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 no. Urban poor people, a research study that we did in Nagra, a very dipstick survey, found that while everybody had a phone, every poor household had a phone, only one in ten women had access to a phone, had a phone. And 90% of the time these were unsmart phones. These were phones that were those original basic phones. And therefore if we want to design smart solutions, we have to design them to the kind of uh, technology that is available to the people plus the skill sets. They could only answer a telephone call, make a telephone call or read an SMS. So if that's the limitation of the skill that women are going to have or people are going to have, then I think our smart solutions have to design to deal with that. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers and uh, bringing together different perspectives. And we do hope that some of you can take back some of the thoughts and ideas into your workplaces and, and kind of try and create a circle of influence 
broaden that circle of influence. Thank you. Thank you, esteemed panelists, for such an insightful discussion. I request Dr. Reno to kindly present a small token of appreciation to all our speakers. These paintings showcase Gond art, which comes with the belief that a good image brings good luck. The Gonds are a major tribal communities of central India. The artists have used natural colors derived from charcoal, colored soil, plant sap, leaves and cow dung. This mystical art form is created by putting together dots and lines. <laughs> Can we have a round of applause please? to kindly present a small token of appreciation to our esteemed chair. Thank you everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for your active participation in this session.